I think, well, people are building habits all the time. So that's the baseline, right? Whether you're thinking about it or not, it's already happening. So because it's already happening, um, I think it makes sense for us to shape our habits carefully, to think, to be thoughtful about it. Um, and so when I say that, you know, amateurs or people, you know, many people are not, are the victim of their habits. I think that's often how it sort of feels to us. Like you're building these habits, you're going through life. You're just kind of trying to solve the problems that you face on a day-to-day -day basis and you stumble into certain solutions. And before you know it, those solutions sort of become a pattern. You know, you get stuck in a rut or you start to like build a groove and, um, if that groove is not favorable, then you feel like, oh, my habits are happening to me. Like I have this thing that I do all the time. And I never even set out to do it. Meanwhile, you you have a, a second option, which is you can start to be the architect of your habits. You can shape your environment. You can design the options that are presented to you. You can be more thoughtful and careful about who you follow on social media or what the items are on your desk or on your kitchen counter at home or the way that your office is laid out or making sure that, you know, a home gym is a more visible option in your home or whatever. Like there's just tons and tons of almost infinite number of options that you can do to try to design an environment where the good action is the path of least resistance with a more obvious thing. And I think that's really the practical takeaway. Uh, if you buy into that idea that it's possible to shape your environment so that it's more favorable, then I think the practical action step is probably two things. One is you wanna make anything that's the cue of your good habits, anything that's visible or available, you wanna make that obvious. You wanna just put it in front of you, have it be the first thing that you see when you sit down at your desk or when you walk into the kitchen or whatever. And then the second thing is you want it to be easy. You want it to be the path of least resistance. So, you know, as much as possible, you're going to try to prime the environment so that it's ready for the next use or that it's, you know, uh, set up for you to succeed. So a couple examples, like um, if you write out what you, at the end of each workday, you can just write out like the top three things that you want to achieve for the next day or whatever number you want it to be. And then you take that little piece of paper and put it on top of your laptop or put it on the keyboard at your desktop or whatever. So that when you walk into your office tomorrow, the very first thing you see is something that reminds you of what your highest value actions are. And, you know, not everybody has to do that, but it just illustrates the point, which is you're trying to prime the environment so that the next action is easy. So the next action is obvious. And the more that you can do that with health, work, wealth, all kinds of things, uh, the more it starts to pay off and you are less of a victim of what happens and more the architect of it. Um, I think one useful question to ask yourself is rather than focusing on the behavior, let's talk about the identity. Uh, and so who is the type of person that could achieve that thing that I want to achieve? So, you know, very common New Year's resolution is lose weight. So instead of say lose 30 pounds, you can ask yourself, who is the type of person that could lose 30 pounds? And you realize, oh, well, maybe it's the type of person who doesn't miss workouts, or maybe it's the type of person who tracks their calories at each meal. And so now suddenly you have something very specific. You have like a very specific habit that you can try to build. Okay, I can try to build the habit of not missing workouts. Doesn't matter what I do during the workout. Doesn't matter how long it is. Doesn't matter how I feel. I'm just trying to not miss. That's the first step toward building that identity. Or, um, okay, now I need to track my calories. Doesn't matter what I eat. Doesn't matter how much I eat or how often. I just need to build the habit of tracking it. And um, you can also see this leads me to my second answer to the question, which is in both of those examples, I tried to scale it down. Uh, and I think that's a big part of getting started is there are a lot of the time people think they are being simple uh, or keeping things simple when in fact it's much more complicated. So for example, let's say you, you're like, okay, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm just going to pick one goal. I'm just going to try to eat healthy this year. But actually, if you break it down, there are a bunch of sub habits associated with that. Like if you're not currently cooking your own meals, then now you got to start building a habit of meal planning, uh, grocery shopping. You uh, once you get the food at home, now you need to start. Maybe you need to learn some knife skills or you just need to get better at cooking, um, having all those recipes ready to go after the meal. If you're eating out a lot right now, you don't have many dishes. Now suddenly you have dirty dishes to clean. So there's, you know, three, four or five different things that are associated with that one habit of eating healthy. 
And so um, as much as possible, I encourage people to scale it down because it's always a little more complicated than it seems on the surface. So let's start with a very small habit, a very easy habit, something that's, I like the line from Leo Babalta where he says, make it so easy you can't say no. Um, and so I like to use like the two minute rule as a guide, just scale it down. Something that takes two minutes or less to do. And so, uh, you know, if you are trying to work out four days a week, all you have to do is put on your running shoes and step out the door. That'll take you two minutes. You're done. Now, if you run, that's a bonus, but like in the beginning, we're just trying to build a habit of showing up. If you can't master that, then, you know, there's nothing else to optimize. But a lot of the time, for some reason with habits, people get very all or nothing. They think if I can't, if I can't run three miles four days a week, why am I even bothering? And what I'm encouraging you to do is just scale it down to the smallest part possible, master the art of showing up, start building up evidence of that new identity. And then once you've done that, well, okay, now we're in a position where we can talk about scaling it up a little bit. But let's take it one, one step at a time. I think I do generally agree with that Jim Rohn quote that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And, you know, we have different pockets of five that you spend time with at, you know, work or friends or family or whatever. But we do tend to uh, soak up the habits of the people who are around us. And um, it's sort of like uh, there's like a, um, the, I, I heard it described well the other day, it's kind of like the temperature in the room. You know, if you, if you walk into a room and you bring an ice cube in, it will melt until it reaches the temperature, the average temperature of the room. If you bring in, you know, something, uh, if you bring in like a hot plate that just came out of the microwave or the oven, it'll cool down until it reaches the temperature of the room. And your habits are kind of like that a lot of the time. They reach the temperature of the room that you're in. They reach the, um, the, the average of the people that you're around. And so you, as best as possible, want to be thoughtful about designing that environment too. You know, we, like you said, we talked about physical environment, but who you spend time with is largely a choice as well. And sometimes people resist this a little bit because they start to think, oh, I need to cut people out of my life or, you know, I need to start... Um, you know, not hanging out with them, or does that mean I need to get rid of family members or whatever? But I would say, don't even worry about that part of it for now. Instead, just ask like, who are the people that I aspire to be like? Or who is someone that when I'm around them, my best self tends to show up? And just focus on spending more time with them. You don't even have to think about spending less time with the other people. It's kind of like um, plants, you know, like one plant that grows a little faster, it crowds the others out. And so by spending more and more time with people who bring out your best self, you kind of crowd out that other time naturally. And um, I think that you can look at this in a couple different ways. Like I said, you've got your work bucket, you've got your friends and family bucket, um, maybe some other areas too. But uh, you don't need a lot to start to feel a real benefit from this. But you do need some sense of community. I think you need some sense of like friendship. That's what really gets it to stick. If you're just trying to spend time around people and you don't really care what they think, I don't know that it'll have that big of an impact on your habits. So for example, if you join a gym, but you don't really care what the other people at the gym think of you, then I don't know that that you're like, oh, I'm around people that work out all the time. Maybe that'll help me too. But you sort of need to build friendships with them. Like you need to say hi, you need to like introduce yourself, you need to um, get to know them. And then actually you care a little bit more about their opinion or you um, start to get to know them and soak up those habits a little more deeply. So I think, yes, the social environment really matters, um, but the reason it matters is because of the expectations that people have of us. And we generally only care about the expectations of people that we respect or like and so on. So friendship plays a big role as well. I mean, I think that's one of the big secrets that CrossFit has going forward as well is that, you know, people will join a CrossFit gym and they start working out there and they thought they were just going to work out and you talk to them six months later and they're eating paleo and they bought a certain type of knee sleeves and weightlifting shoes. And like, it's almost like a, you know, a religion or something they like bring you in and you pick up all these other things along the way. So, um, that effect happens all over in life, you know, like, um, Say you move into a new neighborhood, you walk outside on like Tuesday night and you see your neighbor like cutting their grass and you're like, oh, I need to mow the lawn. I need to trim the hedges. Partially you do that because it feels nice to have a clean lawn, but mostly it feels good to have a clean lawn because you don't want to be the neighbor who's judged by everybody else, you know? So it's the, it's the social expectation 
that gets you to stick to it. And um, I think the final point that I'll just add on this is that that social drive, that sense of community, that sense of social norms and the expectations of others, that's one of the strongest forces for getting a habit to stick for the long run. There are a lot of these other strategies that we talked about, scaling it down, two minute rule, et cetera. Those are really good for getting a habit to start. Just let me make it easy for me to get off square one. But if you want to have it to last for a year or five years or 10 years or more, it's really, you almost never see that happening in isolation. There's almost always, if somebody's sticking to something for a decade, they've got friends who are doing it too. They get to know people in that industry or in that environment or in that area. Like there's, there's a social connection that's a part of that. And that social fabric helps sustain habits for the long term. Yeah, I mean, first of all, this is coming from someone who is very goal oriented, you know, like I've got goals for all kinds of things. And for many years, set goals for, you know, for all types of stuff. But at some point, I realized that it didn't a lot of those things I didn't achieve. Some of them I did, but many I didn't. And so I'm like, well, obviously, setting the goal is not the thing that's making the difference here, because I set them for stuff that worked and stuff that didn't. And what I realized is that the ones that I achieved were things that I had a system for, that I had a process for, that I had a collection of habits built around. And, you know, if you want to take like a, an athletics or a sports example, the goal for any team is to have the best score on the scoreboard at the end of the game. But if you spent the whole game looking at the scoreboard, you would never win. Meanwhile, you can actually imagine a team that doesn't look at the scoreboard at all and just focuses on what's going on on the court or on the field and yeah, they, they actually might win. And so um, in a sense, you always need the system. You don't necessarily need the goal. Um, and in fact, I would say that um, if there is ever a gap between your goal and your system, if there's ever a gap between your desired outcome and your daily habits, your daily habits will always win. The system will always deliver the outcome that it's designed for. And so you can have whatever ambitions, whatever lofty goals you want. If you're not running a system that is organized toward that, that is aligned with that outcome, you're not going to get the outcome. And so um, I don't think goals are useless. I think they're good for setting a sense of direction. I think they're good for clarity. Um, I think they're good as a filtering mechanism. You know, one of the most important things to succeed in any area is to say no to the distractions. And if you understand what your goal is clearly, it's easier to say no. It's easier to run that run new opportunities through that filter and say, does this help me achieve my goal or not? And if not, then I can ignore it. And so goals are helpful for all that stuff. But the system is what determines whether the outcome happens or not. And so my argument is just that we tend to spend too much time talking about goals. Uh, we tend to spend too much time talking about outcomes and not enough time talking about the process and the habits and the daily uh, system that you need to be running to inevitably take yourself toward that outcome. It can be a little tricky, like it may require a little experimentation to figure out what that identity should be for you. Because what you find is for some people, their identity at some point, the tighter you cling to one identity, the harder it becomes to grow beyond it. So this is like a, it's a cycle. It's a feedback loop. You have to go through this, you know, and, um, so, uh, you know, a couple different examples, let's say uh, like a military example, a lot of people after they get done with their service, they're like, man, my identity is I'm a soldier. That's like what I've built myself around. That's who I am. And now suddenly I'm no longer serving. And so like, what am I? They feel like they lost their, themselves. I had something that I felt similarly when my athletic career ended, you know, for 17 years, I was a baseball player. Now, suddenly I'm not, what am I, you know, this is what I spent every week working toward. Now, what do I do? And I think a lot of athletes feel some, you know, version of that. And so what I would say is you need to experiment a little bit with trying to find the principles or the values or the qualities of that role or position that you can carry with you for your whole life. So to take the military example, no, technically you're not a soldier anymore, but there are a lot of things about being a soldier that you can still make part of your identity. I'm a good teammate. I finish what I start. I always, uh, you know, prepare for my mission and so on. And those qualities, preparation, um, you know, uh, finishing what you start, being responsible, being a good teammate, 
you can apply those to anything. You can apply that to work, you can apply that to family, you can apply that to friendship. And so if you take that and make that your core identity, then you start to see all kinds of ways that you can continue to build habits that foster that. And I think that the people who really become elite at their craft, they must have some version of that. I don't know how they would describe it, but like if you take Tom Brady, it obvious, obviously the identity is not to be a Super Bowl winning quarterback because if that was it, he could have stopped it two decades ago, right? It, it obviously is something more than that. Maybe that's part of it, but it must be something more. It must be about fulfilling his potential or something. He's got to have something uh, there that's driving him that is an identity that he can keep returning to even after he wins the Super Bowl. Um, and if you have something like that that can drive you, it can become much more of a lifelong mission or much more, you can sustain that effort for a much longer period of time. Um, and the outcomes and the results happen along the way, which is great but it's not just about that thing. And so I think there needs to be a little experimentation with that. But if you get that right and you come across an identity that feels authentic to you, that feels like it matches with your values and principles, that feels like it's something you can transfer from position to position, role to role, industry to industry, then you really have something special because you can just start building lifelong habits around it and it'll continue to carry you forward. It also makes things much, it actually makes decision-making easier. Like a lot of the time, I think making people struggle to make important choices or hard choices because they're torn. They're like, oh, I see the benefit in this or I see the benefit in that. Like it's, you know, it's tough to wrestle with these trade-offs. But people who have great clarity around the identity that they're trying to build, around the type of person they want to be, who are very, um, yeah, who people who are very clear about what it means to be them. They're self-aware, they're authentic it's kind of easy for them to make those choices because like, look, that's not who I'm trying to be. It, there is something good about option B, but I don't care about that trade-off as much because that's not the identity I'm trying to build. So in a sense, it kind of ultimately comes back to self-awareness uh, in, in that sense. Like you need to be, you need to know what you want. And if you know what you want, then it becomes much easier to choose. But most people in life don't really know what they want. They sort of know what they want. Like we know in a big picture of, I, I know that I would like to not have to worry about money or I want to be healthy or I'd like to have a family or whatever. But like they don't specifically know. And the more specific you can be about that and the more you feel like it aligns with you authentically and what you really want, the easier all of those other decisions become, the easier it becomes to choose which happens to build, how to design your system, all the other stuff. Thank you.